How's it going? My name is Zola Prince. Welcome back to yet another reaction. And today we're checking out another SCP video. And this is made by Dr. Ba. We are checking out SCP-7185 Body Horror Juice. Uh, no idea what that can truly imply. Oh, uh, I'm thinking that comes to the top of my head as the body turns to a liquid. And that's just about it. But other than that, I have no idea what we're truly getting into here. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. In three, two, one. One boom. July 18th, 2014. I was 13 the around this time. Peaceful tranquility or I just turned of the day 13. Has just been disrupted by the squawk of a panic report over the radio. Civilians in danger. Urgent assistance required. The park ranger hears the screams carried through the trees by the wind a second later, already hurtling his way toward the location given by his colleague. Something is very, very wrong. Usually nothing like this happens at Crater Lake National Park. His mind starts racing as fast as the jeep he's driving, a brain entering survival mode, trying to predict every possible danger. A forest fire? It was still daylight. He'd have seen the smoke. An animal yeah. attack? Maybe. Bears could sometimes be seen roaming about on the fringes of the park, but they typically kept away from humans, especially the more people were around. And today, in the midst of July, there were plenty to ward off any strays. Every attempted prediction only raised the same question. Just what the hell was going on? Approaching the tree line, one of the other rangers waves down the car. She's armed. If the vagueness of the report hadn't been troubling enough, seeing another park ranger with a shotgun in her hands certainly was. Yeah, they that's were in bear line. territory. It wasn't unheard of for one of them to the occasionally need a gun to ward the bears off, but that was a rarity out at Crater Lake. Slamming the brakes and leaping out of the jeep, the park ranger rushes towards his colleague as she takes cover behind a nearby tree. He immediately asks her what the situation is, but she urges him to be quiet. There's something out there with them, she tells him in a whisper, racking a live round into her shotgun. When the park ranger asks what, the other ranger shoots him a look. Her eyes say it all. She's terrified and confused. This isn't just a wild animal on a rampage or frightenedly defending its territory and cubs. She has no idea what it is. She can't even believe she's seen it, let alone start describing it. Twigs snap under the foot of something, oh. causing the other ranger to raise her shotgun, leaning out from behind the tree in the direction of the noise. She scans the space a few feet beyond the barrel. Nothing. The park ranger takes a look for himself, not exactly eager to see what it is, but unable to fend off his own curiosity. He spots and he's not even armed. Nothing more than a shape passing between the trees, almost mistaking it for a branch simply moving in the gentle breeze. He taps on the other ranger's shoulder and alerts her. Whatever it is, it's close, and it seems to be walking like a man. The other ranger looks. In a second, she raises her shotgun and fires. A blast of buckshot erupts from the barrel, causing a deafening, high-pitched ringing in the park ranger's ears. He doubles over, clutching his ears as the sound becomes Have you never heard painful, a shotgun go off? Not realizing his colleague fumbling as she grabs a fresh cartridge, or the thing staggering towards them. That is, until he looks up. The moment his hearing returns. But before we go any further, I have a question for you. Does something feel wrong with you? Is something interfering with your Here we go again with the sponsorship. <laughs> again, right, we're back. for supporting this channel. Now back to the bizarre <laughs> creature in the forest. You can watch the ad if you want by clicking it's on the video like in the description. Part of the forest has come to life and assumed the shape of a human being in order to attack them. Oh. The roots cover its body, sealing up the space where its eyes would be. Oregon beaked moss coats its arms and hangs off it like it's been draped in a sheet of yellowy green plants. The creature is horrible to look at, and yet it looks lost. It stumbles, arms outstretched like it's trying to blindly feel its way around, and the park ranger realizes it can't see. Another cartridge clicks into the shotgun tube, pulled back the chamber by the slide of the pump, and the other ranger raises the weapon, steadying her aim so as not to miss this time. Her sights line up. The mossy monstrosity sitting in the center, and her fingers squeezes on the trigger. An unexpected force from below pushes the barrel of the shotgun upwards, pointing it towards the treetops. Another ear-splitting blast rings out, sending nearby birds flying from their nests in panic. The park ranger keeps the weapon pointed up, despite his colleague's protests to let go of her gun. Somebody stuck in there, dripping out and trailing down his neck from his own eardrums. He glances over his shoulder as, whatever it is flees in terror. Startled by the shotgun blast, it runs away between the trees, knocking into some as it moves with uncertainty. 
Minutes later, a team of other rangers arrives, declaring that they're taking over the search effort for the creature that was found lurking Foundation around agents. Crater Lake National Park. These rangers seem... off. They look the part, in full uniforms and everything, but the park ranger can't place their faces. They somehow seem brand new, yet not one of them is phased by the unusual situation. They seemed all the more interested in questioning all the hikers and families visiting the park who had seen the creature, as they were in actually finding it. It was almost as if they didn't want the word getting out. The park ranger decides he can't keep quiet any longer and raises a concern to the newcomers. He tells them that he doesn't think whatever is out there is some kind of monster. He thinks it's human. The new rangers thank him for his input, but insist that they'll take it from here. Little did he know, these weren't other park rangers. Yep. They were agents of the SCP Foundation. They have been embedded within the National Park's rangers to contain SCP-3310, an anomalous log floating in Crater Lake. A said log? To contain a powerful deity named Yao. I didn't expect it to be a log. Who can cause dangerous weather to erupt unless the log is left to float freely. Oh, then so speaking the call of which, comes it's raining right SCP now when Foundation I'm recording this. Command reports of an entity attacking civilians. Since they happen to be nearby, in the same park no less, a handful of agents are sent in to investigate and, if possible, contain the creature. Before too long, the civilian witnesses, even the real park rangers who had tried to kill the entity, have all been interviewed, administered with memory-wiping amnestics, and subsequently released, as if nothing out of the ordinary has even happened. Putting boots to the ground, the search for the unidentified creature doesn't last long. Within two hours, the agents have found what they're looking for. Only, it's not a creature. It's a person. His it is name a person. is Zach Herman. They find him cowering under an alcove near the edge of the lake, his moss-covered skin providing a near-perfect camouflage for him to blend in with his woodland surroundings. The only thing that gives him away is the sound of his frightened sobs. The Foundation agents aren't under orders to neutralize him on sight. Instead, they humanely subdue Zach Herman and arrange to have him taken to a nearby Foundation outpost for examination. SCP-3462, an anomalous humanoid entity known to inhabit a rundown blockbuster video rental store in the nearby Whoa. town of Bend, Oregon, with the area having been sealed off and constantly patrolled by Foundation personnel. So that seems like the best place to take Zach and figure out exactly- Alright, I'll have to check out that SCP later on in the future. I'll see if there's any videos related to it what happened to him. Upon closer examination at the Foundation outpost, it's discovered that Zach Herman has a number of unidentified roots growing through both his skin and internal organs. Given oh. the danger to his life that this poses, he's rushed into an operating theater to undergo emergency surgery. Eighteen hours pass as the Foundation tries to save the man's life. At this time, the surgeons decide that it isn't wise or possible to remove all the roots at once, so instead, they focus on clearing the ones that had grown within and over his eyes, nostrils, ear canals, and throat. Another seven hours of intensive surgery pass, and Zach Herman is still alive. He's not cured, but the roots covering much of his face have at least been cleared. After stabilizing, it's then that he's transferred to Site 56, where the Foundation intends to conduct further operations to remove the growths from his body, as well as ask Zach questions about what happened to him. They're still baffled as to what caused his anomalous mutation into a moss monster. Just where had these roots come from? And what exactly was SCP-7185? Oh, so the log wasn't? Researcher Charlie Canley is tasked with conducting inter- So the log wasn't the entity that we're looking into today, it's something else. I'm wondering why it was a log. I was like, why is there a log there? Views with so the it's unrelated. Zach Herman between it's a separate SCP, it appears. And she wastes no time in unearthing his story. Oak Ridge, Oregon, 60 miles north of Crater Lake National Park, where Zach will eventually be found. That's where he describes the horrific mutation taking place. Given that the roots would grow over his eyes, his vision impaired, he has no idea where he's going until he eventually winds up in Crater Lake. Scared, alone, and changed beyond recognition. And as he describes it, he wasn't the only one. Shortly before his own mutation, Zach mentions witnessing the same happening to Kellen Herman, his husband. The couple, along with a group of several others, are in a small Oregon town reached by traveling to Hills Creek Lake, then following Hills Creek Road south until finding a road sign simply labeled Beard. A uh, beard. place has spent 70 years in ruins, abandoned, oh. and left to be overtaken by the elements. 
Most of the roads leading into the area are blocked off thanks to a landslide, leaving the town completely void of all human life until Zack and his friends arrive in Beard. There are six of them. So the moss and everything else is the SCP? I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. Abandoned town? The anomaly could grow wherever it wanted. Makes sense. In total, including Zack, his husband Kellen, then Azrael, Mark, Angel, and Caleb. Answering an ad on Craigslist, the group has come to Beard after being hired by a man named Sean to scavenge through the abandoned town collecting anything that could potentially be of value. Scrap metal and intact valuables, as long as they can be resold, are worth holding on to. While the group searches, Sean delivers food and supplies to them once per month. One thing that they hope for each time, but never seem to get, is something to drink in their downtime. So on a whim, <laughs> while exploring an abandoned factory they come across, Zack looks for an alternative source of beer for the group to enjoy. What he finds is an unusual blue machine. Pulling levers on it, he finds that it dispenses samples of a surprisingly green liquid. Of course, none of the group immediately drinks it. Not until Angel finds an old journal with entries dating back to the 1930s. It describes the owners of the factory giving the liquid to their workers and only ceasing the practice after the workers stopped getting drunk. Taking that to mean the liquid was safe to drink, the group decided to each take a swig of the green. Initially, none of them feel any change. It's actually rather anticlimactic, at least at first. Soon after, however, they start to feel energized, more alert and awake for much longer without feeling the usually expected fatigue that would bring. It even helps them search through parts of the town quicker, something they're all grateful for. After a week, not one of them even feels the need to sleep. They were even healing from injuries faster, small cuts were sealing in minutes, bruises clearing entirely almost as quickly as they formed. After about a month, the negative side effects start. They start manifesting as small symptoms, the group experiencing various bodily aches that gradually become far, far worse. It affects each of them differently too. Zack starts to experience a tightness in his chest, while Caleb develops a bad fever that leaves him barely able to function. Okay, so I was wrong about the, it being the moss and the grass and everything else. I thought it was just, it was a moss that became extremely contagious and it started rooting around the individuals. That's what I was thinking. A bunch of birds just outside right now. Mark and Angel's <laughs> hair starts falling out in thick clumps too. Soon after, the same is happening to Caleb. His symptoms are the first to worsen. After his hair falls out, his skin starts to do the same. It keeps peeling away, turning red. Then, Sean arrives in Beard. According to the information given by Zack in his interviews with the Foundation, their employer would routinely drive to the town every three months in order to pick up anything valuable the group has recovered. All of them suffering from the ill effects of whatever the liquid they'd all drank was, those of the group that still had the strength to stand rushed to meet Sean and beg him to get them help. Upon taking one look at them, he drives away, abandoning them. Four days after Sean left them there, the sleepless group is startled by screaming in the night. It's Caleb, and he's on fire. What? Panicking, the others try to help, pouring water on him to douse the flames. It seems to work, but it's only a few minutes before the fire starts up again. They even try taking him to the creek that runs through the town, but submerging Caleb in the water only causes his skin to form massive blisters that painfully burst. Keeping him under Whoa. didn't work either. He kept needing to come up for air, and breaking the surface, he started catching fire again the second he was above water. There was nothing they could do to save him. He just kept burning. Caleb is the first of the group to die. It's not clear when this occurred. Investigating the area, the Foundation recovers fragmented journal entries written by Azrael, in which the others all attribute Caleb's death to him having a weak immune system. But normally, diseases don't cause people to spontaneously catch fire. Yeah. By the morning, he is almost completely burned, leaving only a charred corpse that the group buries by the factory. Following Caleb's death, Zack is forced to leave. The others blame him for Caleb's death, and he does as well. He intends to find some other way of getting help for the rest of the group. Kellen joins him, and the couple leave Beard together. Meanwhile, Angel, Mark, and Azrael search for their own way out of the town, but to no avail. Hardly any of the roads are accessible on foot, and those that are just lead to abandoned properties on the woodland outskirts of Beard. According to Azrael's journal entry, they then refocused their efforts towards finding a cure for whatever it was they had drunk. 
it's not much more successful. During Zack and Kellen's absence, Mark is the next group member whose symptoms start to get worse. His hair was almost entirely gone, and soon, rashes started to form over his skin before peeling away. Immediately, he and the other two start to fear that what happened to Caleb might be about to happen to Mark, too. Their only plan is for Mark to stay out in the snow if he starts catching fire in the same way, since, by this point, winter had reached Oregon. But instead of a reoccurrence of Caleb's condition, Mark's skin begins repeatedly forming an unusual bluish-green substance, warm to the touch. It accumulates every few hours, and Angel and Azrael help him scrape it off before it ultimately returns. Within days, it's it? returning faster, too fast for them to clear it. So much of it forms that it starts dripping off Mark. Then Angel points out it seems to be candle wax, and the more of it, the hotter it gets. Shortly after, the substance burns out Mark's eyes. He's completely covered in scalding hot wax, with no way of removing it entirely. Whoa. Eventually, he dies. Angel and Azrael can't move his body thanks to the wax, as more of it keeps forming, nor can they bury him yet thanks to a snowstorm outside. It's only a week later that Azrael thinks he sees the body moving. Mark is still alive. He's been lying in a pile of hot wax the entire time, his body still making more. Soon, he stops moving altogether. While all this is happening, Kellen and Zack are still trying to find help, but manage to wind up lost in the woods surrounding Beard. The numerous overlapping and confusing paths surrounding the town had meant one wrong turn since both of them heading towards the woods, with only a few cans of food, a lighter, and a pocket knife between them. After a week, they pass a mountain that Zack assumes is the Diamond Peak Volcano. Another week later, both he and Kellen are beginning to suffer their own severe symptoms from the liquid they consume. Kellen is vomiting shards of metal and glass. Further metallic chunks were breaking through Kellen's skin as they grew within his body. At the same time, roots grow over Zack's eyes, preventing him from fully seeing just what is happening to his husband. They sit together in Kellen's dying moments, Zack feeling like he needs to be there for his partner, even though he can't see him or do anything to help him. A few hours after Kellen's breathing eventually stops, Zack walks through the woods until he hears the sound of cars, only to be found in Crater Lake National Park. Around the same time, Angel also dies. It takes him a whole week after his eyelids and fingernails fall out, followed by every layer of his skin. It would happen multiple times, thanks to the effects of the green liquid causing him to recover, all so his skin could once again come off. At one point, Azrael, horrified by it all, sees his friend's face fall off. Still unable to find a way out of Beard, one of the remaining two survivors of the group also starts to change. Bumps form under Azrael's skin, eventually causing his hands to become swollen and preventing him from moving anything below his chest. Aware of his impending fate, he stashes the journal he's been writing in inside a backpack and leaves it for whoever finds them. The Foundation is able to recover the bodies of Azrael, Angel, Mark, and the buried remains of Caleb within Beard, but they decline to share this information with Zack. Sean's identity is confirmed to be that of Sean McDougall, and Foundation agents are sent to interrogate him. They aren't able to ascertain any valuable information from him, no, so wasn't there. instead amnesticize him. Anything saved on Sean's devices relating to the location of the town of Beard, the group he hired to scavenge there, and the $46,000 he'd made from the scavenged goods are all seized. SCP-7185 so consists the machine. of two elements. The first is the an liquid. unidentified machine that was uncovered by Zach Herman and his friends in an abandoned factory in the southern Cascadian mountain range of Oregon. Despite not having any power sources connected to it, SCP-7185 seemingly functions without the need for electricity. <laughs> it is instead operated via a series of levers connected to the main body of the device. Two are black and one is rusted over. Should both of the black levers be switched downwards and the rusty lever pulled, the machine will produce the second element of this anomaly, designated by the Foundation as SCP-7185-1, hereby alternatively known as the body horror juice. The alcoholic liquid byproduct of activating SCP-7185 is green in color and has a semi-viscous consistency. If this liquid is drunk at any point by a human being, then this person will undergo major bodily changes that tend to span a period of at least several weeks, 
Anyone ingesting SCP-7185-1 will suffer numerous mutations and deformations of their body, although exactly how they are altered varies depending on the person drinking the juice. SCP-7185-1 also negates the effects of any depressants, opiates, or other stimulants taken after ingestion, meaning there is no way to nullify the pain of these intense physical changes. On July 21, 2014, Zach Herman died due to complications during surgery. The Foundation surgeons had been making extensive efforts to clear the roots growing throughout his body as a result of Herman ingesting SCP-7185. They had made enough of a difference to allow him to participate in interviews with researcher Canley. However, during these exchanges, Zach mentions that he can still feel everything that is happening to him during the procedures. Every incision, every removal, every oh. stitch. The same day, the body of Zach's husband, Kellen Herman, is also recovered. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-420, Aggressive Skin Condition. Um, okay, so I was taking blunders of guests to trying to figure out where the anomaly was being produced. I thought it was person at first, and I thought it was the log, which was kind of out of left field. Then I thought it was the moss and everything else in the town. It grew over, and then I forgot it's a liquid. So, of course, when we got to the machine, like, this has to be it. This has to be it. <laughs> because <laughs> I go into these SCP videos pretty much blind because I want absolutely no spoilers in regards to their properties, like the document and everything else, like the events that go with them, completely uh, blind to me. So I want to keep it as a surprise. But... Other than that, that was a different type of SCP-1. It's been a while since I think I've watched a liquid-related SCP, or at least any of the ones I've recorded in the time of the making of this in the last couple of days. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's been a while since then. So, if you guys enjoyed today's reaction video, please like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.